Chapter 27 There must be a solution, Captain General, Delacqua said patiently. Do you want an overt act of war against a friendly nation? Of course not. Everyone in the great cabin knew that they were all in the same trap. Any overt act put them squarely with Toranaga against Ishido, which they should absolutely avoid in case Ishido was the eventual victor. Presently Ishido controlled Osaka, and the capital, Kyoto, and the majority of the regents. And now, through the daimyos Ono Shur and Kiyama, Ishido controlled most of the southern island of Kyushu, and with Kyushu, the port of Nagasaki, the main center of all trading, and thus all trade in the black ship this year. Torinaga said through Father Alvito, What's so difficult? I just want you to blow the pirates out of the harbor mouth, nay. Torinaga sat uncomfortably in the place of honor, in the high-backed chair at the great table. Alvito sat next to him, the captain general opposite, Delacqua beside the captain general. Mariko stood behind Torinaga and the samurai guards waited near the door, facing the armed seamen. And all the Europeans were conscious that though Alvito translated for Torinaga everything that was said in the room, Mariko was there to ensure that nothing was said openly between them against her master's interests, and that the translation was complete and accurate. Delacqua leaned forward. Perhaps, sire, you could send messengers ashore to Lord Ishido. Perhaps the solution lies in negotiation. We could offer this ship as a neutral place for the negotiations. Perhaps in this way you could settle the war. Torinaga laughed scornfully. What war? We're not at war, Ishido and I. But, sire, we saw the battle on the shore. Don't be naive. Who were killed? A few worthless ronin. Who attacked whom? Only ronin, bandits, or mistaken zealots. And at the ambush? We understand that Browns fought Greys. Bandits were attacking all of us, Browns and Greys. My men merely fought to protect me. In night skirmishes mistakes often happen. If Browns killed Greys or Greys Browns that's a regrettable error. What are a few men to either of us? Nothing. We're not at war. Torinaga read their disbelief so he added. Tell them, Sakusan, that armies fight wars in Japan. These ridiculous skirmishes and assassination attempts are mere probes, to be dismissed when they fail. War didn't begin tonight. It began when the Taiko died. Even before that, when he died without leaving a grown son to follow him. Perhaps even before that, when Garoda, the Lord Protector, was murdered. Tonight has no lasting significance. None of you understands our realm, or our politics. How could you? Of course Ishido's trying to kill me. So are many other daimyos. They've done so in the past, and they'll do so in the future. Kiyama and Onoshir have been both friend and enemy. Listen, if I'm killed that would simplify things for Ishido, the real enemy, but only for a moment. I'm in his trap now, and if his trap's successful he merely has a momentary advantage. If I escape, there never was a trap. But understand clearly, all of you, that my death will not remove the cause of war nor will it prevent further conflict. Only if Ishido dies will there be no conflict. So there's no open war now. None. He shifted in the chair, detesting the odor in the cabin from the oily foods and unwashed bodies. But we do have an immediate problem. I want your cannon. I want them now. Pirates beset me at the harbor mouth. I said earlier, Sakasan, that soon everyone must choose sides. Now, where do you and your leader and the whole Christian church stand? And are my Portuguese friends with me or against me? Delacqua said, You may be assured, Lord Toranaga, we all support your interests. Good. Then remove the pirates at once. That'd be an act of war and there's no profit in it. Perhaps we can make a trade, eh? Ferriara said. Alvito did not translate this but said instead. The captain general says we're only trying to avoid meddling in your politics, Lord Toranaga. We're traitors. Mariko said in Japanese to Toranaga. So sorry, sire, that's not correct. 
That's not what was said. Alvito sighed. I merely transposed some of his words, sire. The captain general is not aware of certain politenesses as he is a stranger. He has no understanding of Japan. But you do have, Tsukasan? Torinaga asked. I try, sire. What did he actually say? Alvito told him. After a pause, Torinaga said, Bianjin san told me the Portuguese were very interested in trade, and in trade they have no manners or humor. I understand and will accept your explanation, Tsukasan. But from now on, please translate everything exactly as it is said. Yes, Lord. Tell the Captain General this. When the conflict is resolved, I will expand trade. I am in favor of trade. Ishido is not. Del Aqua had marked the exchange and hoped that Alvito had covered Ferriera's stupidity. We're not politicians, sire. We're religious and we represent the faith and the faithful. We do support your interests. Yes. I agree. I was considering. Alvito stopped interpreting and his face lit up and he let Torinaga's Japanese get away from him for a moment. I'm sorry, Eminence, but Lord Torinaga said I was considering asking you to build a temple, a large temple in Yido, as a measure of my confidence in your interests. For years, ever since Torinaga had become Lord of the Eight Provinces, Del Aqua had been maneuvering for that concession. And to get it from him now, in the third greatest city in the empire, was a priceless concession. The visitor knew the time had come to resolve the problem of the cannon. Thank him, Martin Sakasan, he said using the code phrase that he had previously agreed upon with Alvito, committing their course of action, with Alvito the standard bearer, and say we will try always to be at his service. Oh yes, and ask him what he had in mind about the cathedral. He added for the captain general's benefit. Perhaps I may speak directly, sire, for a moment. Alvito began to Torinaga. My master thanks you and says what you previously asked is perhaps possible. He will endeavor always to assist you. Endeavor is an abstract word, and unsatisfactory. Yes, sire. Alvito glanced at the guards who, of course, listened without appearing to. But I remember you saying earlier that it is sometimes wise to be abstract. Torinaga understood at once. He waved his hand in dismissal to his men. Wait outside, all of you. Uneasily they obeyed. Alvito turned to Ferriera. We don't need your guards now, Captain General. When the samurai had gone, Ferriera dismissed his men and glanced at Mariko. He wore pistols in his belt and had another in his boot. Alvito said to Torinaga, Perhaps, sire, you would like the Lady Mariko to sit? Again Torinaga understood. He thought for a moment, then half nodded and said, without turning around, Mariko-san, take one of my guards and find the Anjin-san. Stay with him until I send for you. Yes, lord. The door closed behind her. Now they were alone. The four of them. Ferriera said, What's the offer? What's he offering? Be patient, Captain General. Delacqua replied, his fingers drumming on his cross, praying for success. Sire, Alvito began to Torinaga. The Lord my master says that everything you asked he will try to do within the forty days. He will send you word privately about progress. I will be the courier, with your permission. And if he's not successful, it will not be through want of trying, or persuasion, or through want of thought. He gives you his word. Before the Christian God? Yes. Before God. Good. I will have it in writing. Under his seal. Sometimes full agreements, delicate agreements, should not be reduced to writing, sire. You're saying unless I put my agreement in writing you won't? I merely remembered one of your own sayings that a samurai's honor is certainly more important than a piece of paper. The visitor gives you his word before God, his word of honor, as a samurai would. Your honor is totally sufficient for the visitor. I just thought he would be saddened to be so untrusted. Do you wish me to ask for a signature? At length Torinaga said, Very well. 
His word before the God Jesus, nay, his word before his God. I give it on his behalf. He has sworn by the blessed cross to try. You as well, Tsukasan? You have equally my word before my God by the blessed cross that I will do everything I can to help him persuade the Lord's Onosher and Kiyama to be your allies. In return I will do what I previously promised. On the forty-first day you may lay the foundation stone for the biggest Christian temple in the empire. Could that land, sire, be put aside at once? As soon as I arrive at Yido. Now. What about the pirates? The pirates and the fishing boats? You will remove them at once? If you had cannon, would you have done that yourself, sire? Of course, Tsukasan. I apologize for being so devious, sire, but we have had to formulate a plan. The cannon do not belong to us. Please give me one moment. Alvito turned to Del Aqua. Everything is arranged about the cathedral, eminence. Then to Ferriara he added, beginning their agreed plan. You will be glad you did not sink him, Captain General. Lord Toronaga asks if you would carry ten thousand ducats of gold for him when you leave with the black ship for Goa to invest in the gold market in India. We would be delighted to help in the transaction through our usual sources there, placing the gold for you. Lord Toronaga says half the profit is yours. Both Alvito and Del Aqua had decided that by the time the black ship had turned about, in six months, Toronaga either would be reinstated as president of the regents, and therefore more than pleased to permit this most profitable transaction, or he would be dead. You should easily clear four thousand ducats profit. At no risk. In return for what concession? That's more than your annual subsidy from the King of Spain for your whole Society of Jesus in Asia. In return for what? Lord Toronaga says pirates prevent him leaving the harbor. He would know better than you if they're pirates. Ferriera replied in the same matter-of-fact voice that both knew was only for Toronaga's benefit. It's ill-advised to put your faith in this man. His enemy holds all the royal cards. All the Christian kings are against him. Certainly the main two, I heard them with my own ears. They said this Japo's the real enemy. I believe them and not this motherless Cretan. I'm sure Lord Toronaga knows better than us who are pirates and who are not. Del Aqua told him unperturbed, knowing the solution as Alvito knew the solution. I suppose you've no objection to Lord Toronaga's dealing with the pirates himself? Of course not. You have plenty of spare cannon aboard the visitor said. Why not give him some privately? Sell him some, in effect. You sell arms all the time. He's buying arms. Four cannons should be more than enough. It would be easy to transship them in the longboat, with enough powder and shot, again privately. Then the matter is solved. Ferriara sighed. Cannon, my dear eminence, are useless aboard the galley. There are no gun ports, no gun ropes, no gun stanchions. They can't use cannon, even if they had the gunners, which they don't. Both priests were flabbergasted. Useless? Totally. But surely, Don Ferriera, they can adapt. That galley's incapable of using cannon without a refit. It would take at least a week. Nanja? Torinaga said suspiciously aware that something was amiss however much they had tried to hide it. What is it, Toronaga asks? Alvito said. Delacqua knew the sand had run out on them. Captain General, please help us. Please. I ask you openly. We've gained enormous concessions for the faith. You must believe me and yes, you must trust us. You must help Lord Toronaga out of the harbor somehow. I beg you on behalf of the church. The cathedral alone is an enormous concession. Please. Ferriara allowed none of the ecstasy of victory to show. He even added a token gravity to his voice. Since you ask help in the church's name, eminence, of course I'll do what you ask. I'll get him out of this trap. But in return I want the captain generalship of next year's black ship whether this year's is successful or not. That's the personal gift of the king of Spain his alone. 
that's not mine to bestow. Next, I accept the offer of his gold, but I want your guarantee that I'll have no trouble from the viceroy at Goa, or here, about the gold or about either of the black ships. You dare to hold me and the church to ransom? This is merely a business arrangement between you, me, and this monkey. He's no monkey, Captain General. You'd better remember it. Next, 15% of this year's cargo instead of 10. Impossible. Next, to keep everything tidy eminence your word before God now that neither you nor any of the priests under your jurisdiction will ever threaten me with excommunication unless I commit a future act of sacrilege, which none of this is. And further, your word that you and the Holy Fathers will actively support me and help these two black ships also before God. And next, Captain General? Surely that's not all? Surely there's something else? Last, I want the heretic. Mariko stared down at Blackthorn from the cabin doorway. He lay in a semi-coma on the floor, retching his innards out. The bosun was leaning against the bunk leering at her, the stumps of his yellow teeth showing. Is he poisoned, or is he drunk? She asked Tatami Kana, the samurai beside her, trying without success to close her nostrils to the stench of the food and the vomit, to the stench of the ugly seamen in front of her, and to the ever-present stench from the bilges that pervaded the whole ship. It almost looks as though he's been poisoned, nay? Perhaps he has, Mariko-san. Look at that filth! The samurai waved distastefully at the table. It was strewn with wooden platters containing the remains of a mutilated haunch of roast beef, blood rare, half the carcass of a spitted chicken, torn bread and cheese and spilled beer, butter and a dish of cold bacon fat gravy, and a half-emptied bottle of brandy. Neither of them had ever seen meat on a table before. What you want? the bosun asked. No monkeys in here, Wakarimasu? No monkey sands this you room you. He looked at the samurai and waved him away. Out! Piss off! His eyes flowed back over Mariko. What's your name? Namu, eh? What's he saying, Mariko-san? The samurai asked. The bosun glanced at the samurai for a moment, then back to Mariko again. What's the barbarian saying, Mariko-san? Mariko took her mesmerized eyes off the table and concentrated on the bosun. I'm sorry, senor. I didn't understand you. What did you say? Eh? The bosun's mouth dropped farther open. He was a big fat man with eyes too close together and large ears, his hair and a ratty tarred pigtail. A crucifix hung from the rolls of his neck and pistols were loose in his belt. Eh? You can talk Portuguese? A japo who can talk good Portuguese? Where'd you learn to talk civilized? The the Christian father taught me. I'll be a god-cursed son of a whore. Madonna, a flower sand who can talk civilized. Blackthorn retched again and tried feebly to get off the deck. Can you please can you put the pilot there? She pointed at the bunk. Aye. If this monk you'll help. Who? I'm sorry, what did you say? Who? Him. The Japo. Him. The words rocked through her and it took all of her will to remain calm. She motioned to the samurai. Kana-san, will you please help this barbarian? The Anjin-san should be put there. With pleasure, lady. Together the two men lifted Blackthorn and he flopped back in the bunk, his head too heavy, mouthing stupidly. He should be washed, Mariko said in Japanese, still half stunned by what the bosun had called Kana. Yes, Mariko-san. Order the barbarian to send for servants. Yes. Her disbelieving eyes went inexorably to the table again. Do they really eat that? The bosun followed her glance. At once he leaned over and tore off a chicken leg and offered it to her. You hungry? Here, little flower sand, it's good. It's fresh today, real macau capon. She shook her head. The bosun's grizzled face split into a grin and he helpfully dipped the chicken leg into the heavy gravy and held it under her nose. Gravy makes it even better. Hey, it's good to be able to talk proper, eh? Never did that before. Go on, it'll give you strength where it counts. 
It's Macau Capon, I tell you. No, no, thank you. To eat meat to eat meat is forbidden. It's against the law, and against Buddhism and Shintoism. Not in Nagasaki it isn't. The bosun laughed. Lots of Japos eat meat all the time. They all do when they can get it, and swill our grog as well. You're Christian, eh? Go on, try, little Donna. How'd you know till you try? No, no, thank you. A man can't live without meat. That's real food. Makes you strong so you can jiggle like a stoat. Here. He offered the chicken leg to Kana. You want? Kana shook his head, equally nauseated. I. The bosun shrugged and threw it carelessly back onto the table. I it is. What V you done to your arm? You hurt in the fight? Yes. But not badly. Mariko moved it a little to show him and swallowed the pain. Poor little thing. What you want here, Donna Senorita, eh? To see thee and to see the pilot. Lord Toranaga sent me. The pilot's drunk? Yes, that and the food. Per bastard ate too fast and drank too fast. Took half the bottle in a gulp. Injilis re all the same. Can't hold their grog and they've no cojones. His eyes went all over her. I've never seen a flower as small as you before. And never talked to a Japo who could talk civilized before. Do you call all Japanese ladies and samurai Japos and monkeys? The seaman laughed shortly. Hey, senorita, that was a slip of the tongue. That's for usuals, you know, the pimps and whores in Nagasaki. No offense meant. I never did talk to a civilized senorita before, never knowed there was any, by God. Neither have I, senor. I'd never talked to a civilized Portuguese before, other than a holy father. We're Japanese, not Japos, nay? And monkeys are animals, aren't they? Sure. The bosun showed the broken teeth. You speak like a Donna. Yes. No offense, Donna Senorita. Blackthorn began mumbling. She went to the bunk and shook him gently. Anjin San! Anjin San! Yes, yes? Blackthorn opened his eyes. Oh, hello, I'm Sorai. But the weight of his pain and the spinning of the room forced him to lie back. Please send for a servant, senor. He should be washed. There's slaves, but not for that, Donna Senorita. Leave the injuries what's a little vomit to a heretic? No servants? She asked, flabbergasted. We have slaves, black bastards, but they're lazy wouldn't trust one to wash him myself. He added with a twisted grin. Mariko knew she had no alternative. Lord Toranaga might have need of the Anjinsan at once, and it was her duty. Then I need some water, she said, to wash him with. There's a barrel in the stairwell, in the deck below. Please fetch some for me, senor. Send him. The bosun jerked a finger at Kana. No. You will please fetch it. Now. The bosun looked back at Blackthorn. You his doxy? What? The Angeles is doxy? What's a doxy, senor? His woman. His mate, you know, senorita, this pilot's sweetheart, his jigajig. Doxy. No. No, senor, I'm not his doxy. His, then? This Manda samurai's? Or the king's, maybe, him that's just come aboard? Taurus something? You one of his? No. Nor any aboards? She shook her head. Please, would you get some water? The bosun nodded and went out. That's the ugliest, foulest-smelling man I've ever been near, the samurai said. What was he saying? He the man asked if if I was one of the pilot's consorts. The samurai went for the door. Kana-san! I demand the right on your husband's behalf to avenge that insult. At once. As though you'd cohabit with any barbarian. Kana-san. Please close the door. Your Tota Mariko-san. How dare he insult you? The insult must be avenged. It will be Kana-san and I thank you. Yes. I give you the right. But we are here at Lord Toronada's order. 
Until he gives his approval it would not be correct for you to do this. Kana closed the door reluctantly. I agree. But I formally ask that you petition Lord Toranaga before we leave. Yes. Thank you for your concern over my honor. What would Kana do if he knew all that had been said, she asked herself, appalled. What would Lord Toranaga do? Or Hiromatsu? Or my husband? Monkeys? Oh, Madonna, give me thy help to hold myself still and keep my mind working. To ease Kana's wrath, she quickly changed the subject. The Anjin-san looks so helpless. Just like a baby. It seems barbarians can't stomach wine. Just like some of our men. Yes. But it's not the wine. Can't be. It's what he's eaten. Blackthorn moved uneasily, groping for consciousness. They've no servants on the ship, Kana-san, so I'll have to substitute for one of the Anjin-san's ladies. She began to undress Blackthorn, awkwardly because of her arm. Here, let me help you. Kana was very deft. I used to do this for my father when the sake took him. It's good for a man to get drunk once in a while. It releases all the evil spirits. Yes. But my father used to suffer badly the next day. My husband suffers very badly. Four days. After a moment, Kana said, May Buddha grant that Lord Bantaro escapes. Yes. Mariko looked around the cabin. I don't understand how they can live in such squalor. It's worse than the poorest of our people. I was almost fainting in the other cabin from the stench. It's revolting. I've never been aboard a barbarian ship before. I've never been on the sea before. The door opened and the bosun set down the pail. He was shocked at Blackthorn's nudity and jerked out a blanket from under the bunk and covered him. He'll catch his death. Apart from that shameful to do that to a man, even him. What? Nothing. What's your name, Donna Senorita? His eyes glittered. She did not answer. She pushed the blanket aside and washed Blackthorn clean, glad for something to do, hating the cabin and the foul presence of the bosun, wondering what they were talking about in the other cabin. Is our master safe? When she had finished she bundled the kimono and soiled loincloth. Can this be laundered, senor? Eh? These should be cleaned at once. Could you send for a slave, please? They're a lazy bunch of black bastards, I told you. That'd take a week or more. Throw him away, Donna Senorita. They're not worth breath. Our pilot Captain Rodriguez said to give him proper clothes. Here. He opened a sea locker. He said to give him any from here. I don't know how to dress a man in those. He needs a shirt and trousers and codpiece and socks and boots and sea jacket. The bosun took them out and showed her. Then, together, she and the samurai began to dress Blackthorn, still in his half-conscious stupor. How does he wear this? She held up the triangular, bag-like codpiece with its attached strings. Madonna, he wears it in front, like this, the bosun said, embarrassed, fingering his own. You tie it in place over his trousers, like I told. Over his cod. She looked at the bosuns, studying it. He felt her look and stirred. She put the codpiece on Blackthorn and settled him carefully in place, and together she and the samurai put the back strings between his legs and tied the strings around his waist. To the samurai she said quietly, This is the most ridiculous way of dressing I've ever seen. It must be very uncomfortable. Kana replied. Do priests wear them, Mariko-san? Under their robes? I don't know. She brushed a strand of hair out of her eyes. Senor, is the Anjin-san dressed correctly now? Aye, except for his boots. They're there. They can wait. The bosun came over to her, and her nostrils clogged. He dropped his voice, keeping his back to the samurai. You want a quickie? What? I fancy you, senorita, eh? What did you say? There's a bunk in the next cabin. Send your friend aloft. The Injilis is out for an hour yet. I'll pay the usual. What? 
You'll earn a piece of copper even three if you're like a stoat, and you'll straddle the best cock between here and Lisbon, eh? What do you say? The samurai saw her horror. What is it, Mariko-san? Mariko pushed past the bosun, away from the bunk. Her words stumbled. He, he said. Kana drew out his sword instantly but found himself staring into the barrels of two cocked pistols. Nevertheless, he began to lunge. Stop, Kana-san! Mariko gasped. Lord Toronaga forbade any attack until he ordered it. Go on, monkey, come at me, you stink-pissed shithead. You. Tell this monkey to put up his sword or he'll be a headless son of a bitch before he can fart. Mariko was standing within a foot of the bosun. Her right hand was still in her obi, the haft of the stiletto knife still in her palm. But she remembered her duty and took her hand away. Kanasan, replace your sword. Please. We must obey Lord Toranaga. We must obey him. With a supreme effort, Kana did as he was told. I've a mind to send you to hell, Japo. Please excuse him, senor and me, Mariko said, trying to sound polite. There was a mistake, a miz. That monkey-faced bastard pulled a sword. That wasn't a mistake, by Jesus. Please excuse it, senor, so sorry. The bosun wet his lips. I'll forget it if you're friendly, little flower. Into the next cabin with you, and tell this monk tell him to stay here and I'll forget about it. What well, what's your name, senor? Pesaro. Manuel Pesaro, why? Nothing. Please excuse the misunderstanding, senor Pesaro. Get in the next cabin. Now. What's going on? What's? Blackthorn did not know if he was awake or still in a nightmare, but he felt the danger. What's going on, by God? This stinking Japo drew on me. It was a mistake, Anjin-san, Mariko said. I've apologized to the Senor Pesaro. Mariko? Is that you, Mariko-san? Hi, Anjin-san. Hanto. Hanto. She came nearer. The bosun's pistols never wavered off Kana. She had to brush past him, and it took an even greater effort not to take out her knife and gut him. At that moment the door opened. The youthful helmsman came into the cabin with a pail of water. He gawked at the pistols and fled. Where's Rodriguez? Blackthorn said, attempting to get his mind working. Aloft, where a good pilot should be, the bosun said, his voice grating. This chapo drew on me, by God! Help me up on deck. Blackthorn grasped the bunk sides. Mariko took his arm, but she could not lift him. The bosun waved a pistol at Kana. Tell him to help. And tell him if there's a god in heaven he'll be swinging from the yardarm before the turn. First mate Santiago took his ear away from the secret knothole in the wall of the great cabin, the final. Well, that's all settled then. From Del Aqua ringing in his brain. Noiselessly he slipped across the darkened cabin, out into the corridor, and closed the door quietly. He was a tall, spare man with a lived-in face, and wore his hair in a tarred pigtail. His clothes were neat, and like most seamen, he was barefoot. In a hurry, he shinned up the companionway, ran across the main deck up onto the quarterdeck where Rodriguez was talking to Mariko. He excused himself and leaned down to put his mouth very close to Rodriguez's ear and began to pour out all that he had heard, and had been sent to hear, so that no one else on the quarterdeck could be party to it. Blackthorn was sitting aft on the deck, leaning against the gunwale, his head resting on his bent knees. Mariko sat straight-backed facing Rodriguez, Japanese fashion, and Kana, the samurai, bleakly beside her. Armed seamen swarmed the decks and crows nest aloft, and two more were at the helm. The ship still pointed into the wind, the air and night clean, the nimbus stronger and rain not far off. A hundred yards away the galley lay broadside, at the mercy of their cannon, oars shipped, except for two each side which kept her in station, the slight tide taking her. The ambushing fishing ships with hostile samurai archers were closer but they were not encroaching as yet. Mariko was watching Rodriguez and the mate. 
She could not hear what was being said, and even if she could, her training would have made her prefer to close her ears. Privacy in paper houses was impossible without politeness and consideration. Without privacy civilized life could not exist, so all Japanese were trained to hear and not hear. For the good of all. When she had come on deck with Blackthorn, Rodriguez had listened to the boatswain's explanation and to her halting explanation that it was her fault, that she had mistaken what the boatswain had said, and that this had caused Kana to pull out his sword to protect her honor. The boatswain had listened, grinning, his pistols still leveled at the samurai's back. I only asked if she was the Angelis's doxy, by God, she being so free with washing him and sticking his privates into the cod. Put up your pistols, boatswain. He's dangerous, I tell you. String him up. I'll watch him. Go for art. This monkey'd be killed me if I wasn't faster. Put him on the yardarm. That's what we'd do in Nagasaki. We're not in Nagasaki, go for art. Now. And when the boatswain had gone, Rodriguez had asked, What did he say to you, senora? Actually say? In nothing, senor. Please. I apologize for that man's insolence to you and to the samurai. Please apologize to the samurai for me, asked his pardon. And I ask you both formally to forget the boatswain's insults. It will not help your liege lord or mine to have trouble aboard. I promise you I will deal with him in my own way in my own time. She had spoken to Kana and, under her persuasion, at length he had agreed. Kana-san says, very well, but if he ever sees the boatswain Pesaro on shore he will take his head. That's fair, by God. Yes. Domo Arigato, Kana-san, Rodriguez said with a smile. And Domo Arigato goes Yamashita, Mariko-san. You speak Japanese? Oh no, just a word or two. I've a wife in Nagasaki. Oh, you have been long in Japan? This is my second tour from Lisbon. I've spent seven years in these waters all told here, and back and forth to Macau and to Goa. Rodriguez added, Pay no attention to him, he's ETA. But Buddha said even ETA have a right to life. Nay, of course. Mariko said, the name and face branded forever into her mind. My wife speaks some Portuguese, nowhere near as perfectly as you. You're Christian, of course? Yes. My wife's a convert. Her father's samurai, though a minor one. His liege lord is Lord Kiyama. She is lucky to have such a husband, Mariko said politely, but she asked herself, staggered, how could one marry and live with a barbarian? In spite of her inherent manners, she asked, Does the lady, your wife, eat meat like like that in the cabin? No, Rodriguez replied with a laugh, his teeth white and fine and strong. And in my house at Nagasaki I don't eat meat either. At sea I do and in Europe. It's our custom. A thousand years ago before the Buddha came it was your custom too, nay? Before Buddha lived to point the Tao, the way, all people ate meat. Even here, senora. Even here. Now, of course, we know better, some of us, nay? Mariko thought about that. Then she said, Do all Portuguese call us monkeys? And Japos? Behind our backs? Rodriguez pulled at the earring he wore. Don't you call us barbarians? Even to our face? We're civilized. At least we think so, senora. In India, the land of Buddha, they call Japanese. Eastern devils and won't allow any to land if they're armed. You call Indians blacks and non-human. What do the Chinese call Japanese? What do you call the Chinese? What do you call the Koreans? Garlic eaters, nay? I don't think Lord Toranaga would be pleased. Or Lord Hiromatsu, or even the father of your wife. The blessed Jesus said, First cast the moat out of your own eye before you cast the beam out of mine. She thought about that again now as she watched the first mate whispering urgently to the Portuguese pilot. It's true, we sneer at other people. But then, we're citizens of the land of the gods, and therefore especially chosen by the gods. We alone, of all peoples, are protected by a divine emperor. 
aren't we, therefore, completely unique and superior to all others? And if you are Japanese and Christian? I don't know. Oh, Madonna, give me thy understanding. This Rodriguez pilot is as strange as the English pilot. Why are they very special? Is it their training? It's unbelievable what they do, nay. How can they sail around the earth and walk the sea as easily as we do the land? Would Rodriguez's wife know the answer? I'd like to meet her and talk to her. The mate lowered his voice even more. He said what? Rodriguez exclaimed with an involuntary curse, and in spite of herself Mariko tried to listen. But she could not hear what the mate repeated. Then she saw them both look at Blackthorn and she followed their glance, perturbed by their concern. What else happened, Santiago? Rodriguez asked guardedly, conscious of Mariko. The mate told him in a whisper behind a cupped mouth. How long will they stay below? They were toasting each other. And the bargain. Bastards! Rodriguez caught the mate's shirt. No word of this, by God. On your life! No need to say that, pilot. There's always a need to say it. Rodriguez glanced across at Blackthorn. Wake him up! The mate went over and shook him roughly. What's the matter, eh? Hit him! Santiago slapped him. Jesus Christ style. Blackthorn was on his feet, his face on fire, but he swayed and fell. God damn you, wake up, Ingles! Furiously Rodriguez stabbed a finger at the two helmsmen. Throw him overboard. Eh? Now, by God! As the two men hurriedly picked him up, Mariko said, Pilot Rodriguez, you mustn't. But before she or Kana could interfere, the two men had hurled Blackthorn over the side. He fell the twenty feet and belly flopped in a cloud of spray and disappeared. In a moment he surfaced, choking and spluttering, flailing at the water, the ice cold clearing his head. Rodriguez was struggling out of his sea chair. Madonna, give me a hand! One of the helmsmen ran to help as the first mate got a hand under his armpit. Christ Jesus, be careful, mind my foot, you clumsy dumb head. They helped him to the side. Blackthorn was still coughing and spluttering, but now as he swam for the side of the ship he was shouting curses at those who had cast him overboard. Two points starboard, Rodriguez ordered. The ship fell off the wind slightly and eased away from Blackthorn. He shouted down, Stay to hell off my ship! Then urgently to his first mate, Take the longboat, pick up the Ingles, and put him aboard the galley. Fast. Tell him. He dropped his voice. Mariko was grateful that Blackthorn was not drowning. Pilot. The Anjin Sands under Lord Toranaga's protection. I demand he be picked up at once. Just a moment. Mariko San. Rodriguez continued to whisper to Santiago, who nodded then scampered away. I'm sorry, Mariko San, Goman Kadasai, but it was urgent. The Ingles had to be woken up. I knew he could swim. He has to be alert and fast. Why? I'm his friend. Did he ever tell you that? Yes. But England and Portugal are at war. Also Spain. Yes but pilots should be above war. Then to whom do you owe duty? To the flag. Isn't that to your king? Yes and no, senora. I owe the Ingles a life. Rodriguez was watching the longboat. Steady as she goes now put her into the wind. He ordered the helmsman. Yes, senor. He waited, checking and rechecking the wind and the shoals and the far shore. The leadsman called out the fathoms. Sorry, senora, you were saying? Rodriguez looked at her momentarily, then went back once more to check the lie of his ship and the longboat. She watched the longboat, too. The men had hauled Blackthorn out of the sea and were pulling hard for the galley, sitting instead of standing and pushing the oars. She could no longer see there. Faces clearly. Now the Anjin San was blurred with the other man close beside him, the man that Rodriguez had whispered to. What did you say to him, senor? Who? Him. 
the senor you sent after the Anjin San. Just to wish the Ingles well and Godspeed. The reply was flat and noncommittal. She translated to Kana what had been said. When Rodriguez saw the longboat alongside the galley he began to breathe again. Hail Mary, Mother of God! The Captain General and the Jesuits came up from below. Torinaga and his guards followed. Rodriguez. Launch the longboat. The fathers are going ashore. Ferriara said. And then? And then we put to sea. For Yido. Why there? We were sailing from Macau. Rodriguez replied, the picture of innocence. We're taking Torinaga home to Yido. First. We're what? But what about the galley? She stays or she fights her way out. Rodriguez seemed to be even more surprised and looked at the galley, then at Mariko. He saw the accusation written in her eyes. Matsu, the pilot told her quietly. What? Father Alvito asked. Patience? Why patience, Rodriguez? Saying Hail Mary's father. I was saying to the lady it teaches you patience. Ferriero was staring at the galley. What's our longboat doing there? I sent the heretic back aboard. You what? I sent the Ingles back aboard. What's the problem, Captain General? The Ingles offended me so I threw the bugger overboard. I'd have let him drown but he could swim so I sent the mate to pick him up and put him back aboard his ship as he seemed to be in Lord Torinaga's favor. What's wrong? Fetch him back aboard. I'll have to send an armed boarding party, Captain General. Is that what you want? He was cursing and heaping hellfire on us. He won't come back willingly this time. I want him back aboard. What's the problem? Didn't you say the galleys to stay and fight or whatever? So what? So the Ingles is hit deep in shit. Good. Who needs the bugger anyway? Surely the fathers prefer him out of their sight. Eh, father? Delacqua did not reply. Nor did Alvito. This disrupted the plan that Ferriera had formulated and had been accepted by them and by Torinaga, that the priests would go ashore at once to smooth over Ishido, Kiyama, and Onoshir. Professing that they had believed Torinaga's story about the pirates and did not know that he had escaped from the castle. Meanwhile the frigate would charge for the harbor mouth, leaving the galley to draw off the fishing boats. If there was an overt attack on the frigate, it would be beaten off with cannon and the die cast. But the boats shouldn't attack us, Ferriera had reasoned. They have the galley to catch. It will be your responsibility, eminence, to persuade Ishido that we had no other choice. After all, Torinaga is president of the regents. Finally, the heretic stays aboard. Neither of the priests had asked why. Nor had Ferriera volunteered his reason. The visitor put a gentle hand on the captain general and turned his back on the galley. Perhaps it's just as well the heretic's there, he said, and he thought, how strange are the ways of God. No, Ferriera wanted to scream. I wanted to see him drown. A man overboard in the early dawn at Sino Trace. No witnesses, so easy. Torinaga would never be the wiser, a tragic accident, as far as he was concerned. And it was the fate Blackthorn deserved. The Captain General also knew the horror of sea death to a pilot. Nanja? Torinaga asked. Father Alvito explained that the pilot was on the galley and why. Torinaga turned to Mariko, who nodded and added what Rodriguez had said previously. Torinaga went to the side of the ship and gazed into the darkness. More fishing boats were being launched from the north shore, and the others would soon be in place. He knew that the Anjin San was a political embarrassment, and this was a simple way the gods had given him if he desired to be rid of the Anjin San. Do I want that? Certainly the Christian priests will be vastly happier if the Anjin San vanishes, he thought. And also Onoshur and Kiyama who feared the man so much that either or both had mounted the assassination attempts. Why such fear? It's karma that the Anjin San is on the galley now and not safely here. Nay, 
so the Anjin San will drown with the ship, along with Yabu and the others in the guns, and that is also karma. The guns I can lose, Yabu I can lose. But the Anjin San? Yes. Because I still have eight more of these strange barbarians in reserve. Perhaps their collective knowledge will equal or exceed that of this single man. The important thing is to be back in Yido as quickly as possible to prepare for the war, which cannot be avoided. Kiyama and Ono sure? Who knows if they'll support me? Perhaps they will, perhaps not. But a plot of land and some promises are nothing in the balance if the Christian weight is on my side in forty days. It's karma, Tsukasan. Nay? Yes, sire. Alvito glanced at the captain general, very satisfied. Lord Toronaga suggests that nothing is done. It's the will of God. Is it? The drum on the galley began abruptly. The oars bit into the water with great strength. What in the name of Christ is he doing? Ferriera bellowed. And then, as they watched the galley pulling away from them, Torinaga's pennant came fluttering down from the masthead. Rodriguez said, Looks like they're telling every god-cursed fishing boat in the harbor that Lord Torinaga's no longer aboard. What's he going to do? I don't know. Don't you? Ferriera asked. No. But if I was him I'd head for sea and leave us in the cesspit or try to. The Ingles has put the finger on us now. What's it to be? You're ordered to Yido. The captain general wanted to add, if you ran the galley all the better, but he didn't. Because Mariko was listening. The priest thankfully went ashore in the longboat. All sails ho! Rodriguez shouted, his leg paining and throbbing. So by so west! All hands lay to. Senora, please tell Lord Torinaga he'd best go below. It'll be safer, Ferriera said. He thanks you and says he will stay here. Ferriera shrugged, went to the edge of the quarterdeck. Prime all cannon. Load grape. Action stations. Chapter 28 Isogi! Blackthorn shouted, urging the oars master to increase the beat. He looked aft at the frigate that was bearing down on them, close hauled now under full sail, then forard again, estimating the next tack that she must use. He wondered if he had judged right, for there was very little sea room here near the cliffs, barely a few yards between disaster and success. Because of the wind, the frigate had to tack to make the harbor mouth, while the galley could maneuver at its whim. But the frigate had the advantage of speed and on the last tack Rodriguez had made it clear that the galley had better stay out of the way when the Santa Teresa needed sea room. Yabu was chattering at him again, but he paid no heed. Don't understand Wakarimasan, Yabu San. Listen, Toranaga Sama said me, Anjin San, Ichiban Ayame. I'm Chief Captain San now. Wakarimasu ka, Yabu San? He pointed the course on the compass to the Japanese captain who gesticulated at the frigate, barely fifty yards aft now, overtaking them rapidly on another collision path. Hold your course, by God! Blackthorn said, the breeze cooling his sea-sodden clothes, which chilled him but helped to clear his head. He checked the sky. No clouds were near the bright moon and the wind was fair. No danger there, he thought. God keep the moon bright till we're through. Hey, Captain! He called out in English, knowing it made no difference if he spoke English or Portuguese or Dutch or Latin because he was alone. Send someone for sake. Sake. Wakarimasu ka? Hi, Anjin-san. A seaman was sent scurrying. As the man ran he looked over his shoulder, frightened by the size of the approaching frigate and her speed. Blackthorn held their course trying to force the frigate to turn before she had gained all space to windward. But she never wavered and came directly at him. At the last second he swung out of her way and then, when her bowsprit was almost over their aft deck, he heard Rodriguez order. Bear on the larboard tack. Let go stay zealous, and steady as she goes. Then a shout at him in Spanish. Thy mouth in the devil's arse, Ingles. 
Thy mother was there first, Rodriguez. Then the frigate peeled off the wind to scud now for the far shore, where she would have to turn again to reach into the wind and tack for this side once more before she could turn a last time again and make for the harbor mouth. For an instant the ships were so close that he could almost touch her, Rodriguez, Toranaga, Mariko, and the captain general swaying on the quarterdeck. Then the frigate was away, and they were twisting in her wash. Isogi, Isogi, by God! The rowers redoubled their efforts, and with signs Blackthorn ordered more men on the oars until there were no reserves. He had to get to the mouth before the frigate, or they were lost. The galley was eating up the distance. But so was the frigate. At the far side of the harbor she spun like a dancer, and he saw that Rodriguez had added topsails and gallants. He's as canny a bastard as any Portuguese born. The sake arrived, but it was taken out of the seaman's hands by the young woman who had helped Mariko and offered precariously to him. She had stayed gamely on deck, even though clearly out of her element. Her hands were strong, her hair well groomed, and her kimono rich, in good taste and neat. The galley lurched in the chop. The girl reeled and dropped the cup. Her face did not change, but he saw the flush of shame. Poor Nada, he said as she groped for it. It doesn't matter. Namika? Yusagi Fujiko Anjin-san. Fujiko-san. Here, give it to me. Dozo. He held out his hand and took the flask and drank directly from it, gulping the wine, eager to have its heat inside his body. He concentrated on the new course, skirting the shoals that Santiago, on Rodriguez's orders, had told him about. He rechecked the bearing from the headland that gave them a clean, hazardous run to the mouth while he finished the warmed wine, wondering in passing how it had been warmed, and why they always served it warm and in small quantities. His head was clear now, and he felt strong enough, if he was careful. But he knew he had no reserves to draw upon, just as the ship had no reserves. Sake, Dozo, Fujiko-san. He handed her the flask and forgot her. On the windward tack the frigate made way too well, and she passed a hundred yards ahead of them, bearing for the shore. He heard obscenities coming down on the wind and did not bother to reply, conserving his energy. Isogi, by God! We're losing! The excitement of the race and of being alone again and in command more by the strength of his will than by position added to the rare privilege of having Yabu in his power, filled him with unholy glee. If it wasn't that the ship go down and me with her, I'd put her on the rocks just to see you drown, shitface Yabu. For old Piterson. But didn't Yabu save Rodriguez when you couldn't? Didn't he charge the bandits when you were ambushed? and he was brave tonight. Yes, he's a shitface, but even so he's a brave shitface, and that's the truth. The flask of sake was offered again. Domo, he said. The frigate was keeled over, close-hauled and greatly pleasing to him. I couldn't do better, he said aloud to the wind. But if I had her, I'd go through the boats and out to sea and never come back. I'd sail her home, somehow, and leave the Japans to the Japanese and to the pestilential Portuguese. He saw Yabu and the captain staring at him. I wouldn't really, not yet. There's a black ship to catch and plunder to be had. And revenge, eh, Yabu-san? Nandisuka Anjin-san? Nanja? Ichiban? Number one, he replied, waving at the frigate. He drained the flask. Fujiko took it from him. Sake, Anjin-san? Domo, I. The two ships were very near the mast fishing boats now, the galley heading straight for the pass that had been deliberately left between them, the frigate on the last reach and turning for the harbor mouth. Here the wind freshened as the protecting headlands fell away, open sea half a mile ahead. Gusts billowed the frigate's sails, the shrouds crackling like pistol shots, froth now at her bow and in her wake. The rowers were bathed with sweat and flagging. One man dropped. And another. The fifty-odd ronin samurai were already in position. Ahead, archers in the fishing boats either side of the narrow channel were arming their bows. Blackthorn saw small braziers in many of the boats, 
and he knew that the arrows would be fire arrows when they came. He had prepared for battle as best he could. Yabu had understood that they would have to fight, and had understood fire arrows immediately. Blackthorn had erected protective wooden bulkheads around the helm. He had broken open some of the crates of muskets, and had set those who could to arming them with powder and with shot. And he had brought several small kegs of powder up onto the quarterdeck and fused them. When Santiago, the first mate, had helped him aboard the longboat, he had told him that Rodriguez was going to help, with God's good grace. Why? he had asked. My pilot says to tell you that he had you thrown overboard to sober you up, senor. Why? Because he said to tell you, senor pilot, because there was danger aboard the Santa Teresa, danger for you. What danger? You are to fight your own way out, he tells you if you can. But he will help. Why? For the Madonna's sweet sake, hold your heretic tongue and listen, I've little time. Then the mate had told him about the shoals and the bearings and the way of the channel and the plan, and given him two pistols. How good a shot are you, my pilot asks. Plur. He had lied. Go with God, my pilot said to tell you finally. And him and you. For me I assign thee to hell. Thy sister. Blackthorn had fused the kegs in case the cannon began and there was no plan, or if the plan proved false, and also against encroaching hostels. Even such a little keg, the fusilite, floated against the side of the frigate would sink her as surely as a seventy-gun broadside. It doesn't matter how small the keg, he thought, providing it guts her. I so you for your lives, he called out and took the helm, thanking God for Rodriguez and the brightness of the moon. Here at the mouth the harbor narrowed to four hundred yards deep water was almost shore to shore, the rock headlands rising sharp from the sea. The space between the ambushing fishing boats was a hundred yards. The Santa Teresa had the bit between her teeth now, the wind abaft the beam to starboard, strong wake aft, and she was gaining on them fast. Blackthorn held the center of the channel and signed to Yabu to be ready. All their ronin samurai had been ordered to squat below the gunnels, unseen, until Blackthorn gave the signal, when it was every man with musket or sword to port or to starboard, wherever they were needed, Yabu commanding the fight. The Japanese captain knew that his oarsmen were to follow the drum, and the drum master knew that he had to obey the Anjin-san, and the Anjin-san alone was to guide the ship. The frigate was fifty yards astern, in mid-channel heading directly for them, and making it obvious that she required the mid-channel path. Aboard the frigate, Ferriera breathed softly to Rodriguez. Ram him! His eyes were on Mariko, who stood ten paces off, near the railings, with Toranaga. We daren't not with Toranaga there and the girl. Senora! Ferriera called out. Senor better to get below, you and your master. It'd be safer for him on the gun deck. Mariko translated to Toranaga, who thought a moment, then walked down the companionway onto the gun deck. God damn my eyes, the chief gunner said to no one in particular. I'd like to fire a broadside and sink something. It's a god curse year since we sunk even a pox pirate. Aye, the monkeys deserve a bath. On the quarterdeck Ferriera repeated. Ram the galley, Rodriguez. Why kill your enemy when others read doing it for you? Madonna! You're as bad as the priest. Thou hast no blood in thee. Yes, I have none of the killing blood, Rodriguez replied, also in Spanish. But thou? Thou hast it. Eh? And Spanish blood, perhaps? Are you going to ram him or not? Ferriera asked in Portuguese, the nearness of the kill possessing him. If she stays where she is, yes. Then, Madonna, let her stay where she is. What had you in mind for the Ingles? Why were you so angry he wasn't aboard us? I do not like you or trust you now, Rodriguez. Twice you've sided, or seemed to side, with the heretic against me or us. If there was another acceptable pilot in all Asia, I would beat you, Rodriguez, and I would sail off with my black ship then you will drown. 
There's a smell of death over you and only I can protect you. Ferriera crossed himself superstitiously. Madonna, thou and thy filthy tongue. What right hast thou to say that? My mother was a gypsy and she the seventh child of a seventh child, as I am. Liar! Rodriguez smiled. Ah, my lord captain general, perhaps I am. He cupped his hands and shouted. Action stations! And then to the helmsman. Steady as she goes, and if that belly gutter whore doesn't move, sink her. Blackthorn held the wheel firmly, arms aching, legs aching. The oars master was pounding the drum, the oarsman making a final effort. Now the frigate was twenty yards astern, now fifteen, now ten. Then Blackthorn swung hard to port. The frigate almost brushed them, heeled over toward them, and then she was alongside. Blackthorn swung hard as starboard to come parallel to the frigate, ten yards from her. Then, together side by side they were ready to run the gauntlet between the hostels. Pull, pull, you bastards! Blackthorn shouted, wanting to stay exactly alongside, because only here were they guarded by the frigate's bulk and by her sails. Some musket shots. Then a salvo of burning arrows slashed at them, doing no real damage, but several by mistake struck the frigate's lower sails and fire broke out. All the commanding samurai in the boats stopped their archers in horror. No one had ever attacked a southern barbarian ship before. Don't they alone bring the silks which make every summer's humid heat bearable, and every winter's cold bearable, and every spring and fall a joy? Aren't the southern barbarians protected by imperial decrees? Wouldn't burning one of their ships infuriate them so much that they would, rightly, never come back again? So the commanders held their men in check while Torunaga's galley was under the frigate's wing, not daring to risk the merest chance that one of them would be the cause of the cessation of the black ships without General Ishido's direct approval. And only when seamen on the frigate had doused the flames did they breathe easier. When the arrows stopped, Blackthorn also began to relax. And Rodriguez. The plan was working. Rodriguez had surmised that under his lee the galley had a chance, its only chance. But my pilot says you must prepare for the unexpected, Ingles, Santiago had reported. Shove that bastard aside, Ferriera said. God damn it, I ordered you to shove him into the monkeys. Five points to port, Rodriguez ordered obligingly. Five points to port it is, the helmsman echoed. Blackthorn heard the command. Instantly he steered port five degrees and prayed. If Rodriguez held the course too long they would smash into the fishing boats and be lost. If he slackened the beat and fell behind, he knew the enemy boats would swamp him whether they believed Torinaga was aboard or not. He must stay alongside. Five points starboard, Rodriguez ordered, just in time. He wanted no more fire arrows either. There was too much powder on deck. Come on, you pimp, he muttered to the wind. Put your cojones in my sails and get us to hell out of here. Again Blackthorn had swung five points starboard to maintain station with the frigate, and the two ships raced side by side, the galley's starboard oars almost touching the frigate, the port oars almost swamping the fishing boats. Now the captain understood, and so did the oars master and the rowers. They put their final strength into the oars. Yabu shouted a command and the ronin samurai put down their bows and rushed to help and Yabu pitched in also. Neck and neck. Only a few hundred yards to go. Then graze on some of the fishing boats, more intrepid than the others, sculled forward into their path and through grappling hooks. The prow of the galley swamped the boats. The grappling hooks were cast overboard before they caught. The samurai holding them were drowned. And the stroke did not falter. Go more to port. I daren't, Captain General. Torinaga's no fool and look, there's a reef ahead. Ferriera saw the spines near the last of the fishing boats. Madonna, drive him onto it. Two points port. Again the frigate swung over and so did Blackthorn. Both ships aimed for the mast fishing boats. Blackthorn had also seen the rocks. Another boat was swamped, 
and a salvo of arrows came aboard. He held his course as long as he dared, then shouted, Five points starboard! to warn Rodriguez, and swung the helm over. Rodriguez took evasive action and fell away. But this time he held a slight collision course which was not part of the plan. Go on, you bastard, Rodriguez said, whipped by the chase and by dread. Let's weigh your cojones. Blackthorn had to choose instantly between the spines and the frigate. He blessed the rowers, who still stayed at their oars, and the crew and all aboard who, through their discipline, gave him the privilege of choice. And he chose. He swung further to starboard, pulled out his pistol and aimed it. Make way, by God! he shouted and pulled the trigger. The ball whined over the frigate's quarterdeck just between the Captain General and Rodriguez. As the Captain General ducked, Rodriguez winced. Thou ingles son of a milkless whore! Was that luck or good shooting or did you aim to kill? He saw the second pistol in Blackthorn's hand, and Torinaga staring at him. He dismissed Torinaga as unimportant. Blessed Mother of God, what should I do? Stick with the plan or change it? Isn't it better to kill this Ingles? For the good of all? Tell me, yes or no. Answer thyself, Rodriguez, on thy eternal soul. Art thou not a man? Listen then, other heretics will follow this Ingles now, like lice, whether this one is killed or not killed. I owe him a life and I swear I do not have the killing blood in me not to kill a pilot. Starboard your helm, he ordered and gave way. My master asks why did you almost smash into the galley? It was just a game, senora, a game pilots play. To test the other's nerves. And the pistol shot? Equally a game to test my nerve. The rocks were too close and perhaps I was pushing the ingles too much. We are friends, no? My master says it is foolish to play such games. Please give him my apologies. The important thing is that he is safe and now the galley is safe and therefore I am glad. Hanto, you arranged this escape, this ruse, with the Anjin San? It happened that he is very clever and was perfect in his timing. The moon lit his way, the sea favored him, and no one made a mistake. But why the hostiles didn't swamp him, I don't know. It was the will of God. Was it? Ferriara said. He was staring at the galley astern of them, and he did not turn around. They were well beyond the harbor mouth now, safely out into the Osaka roads, the galley a few cables aft, either ship hurrying. Most of the galley's oars had been shipped temporarily, leaving only enough to make way calmly while the majority of the oarsmen recuperated. Rodriguez paid Captain General Ferriera no heed. He was absorbed instead with Torinaga. I'm glad we're on Torinaga's side, Rodriguez told himself. During the race, he had studied him carefully, glad for the rare opportunity. The man's eyes had been everywhere, watching gunners and guns and the sails and the fire party with an insatiable curiosity, asking questions, through Mariko, of the seaman or the mate, what's this for? How do you load a cannon? How much powder? How do you fire them? What are these ropes for? My master says, perhaps it was just karma. You understand karma, Captain Pilot? Yes. He thanks you for the use of your ship. Now he will go back to his own. What? Ferriera turned around at once. We'll be in Yido long before the galley. Lord Torinaga's welcome to stay aboard. My master says, there's no need to trouble you anymore. He will go on to his own ship. Please ask him to stay. I would enjoy his company. Lord Torinaga thanks you, but he wishes to go at once to his own ship. Very well. Do as he says, Rodriguez. Signal her and lower the longboat. Ferriero was disappointed. He had wanted to see Yido and wanted to get to know Torinaga better now that so much of their future was tied to him. He did not believe what Torinaga had said about the means of avoiding war. We're at war on this monkey's side against the Shido whether we like it or not. And I don't like it. I'll be sorry not to have Lord Torinaga's company. He bowed politely. 
Torinaga bowed back and spoke briefly. My master thanks you. To Rodriguez, she added, My master says he will reward you for the galley when you return with the black ship. I did nothing. It was merely a duty. Please excuse me for not getting up from my chair my leg, nay? Rodriguez replied, bowing. Go with God, senora. Thank you, Captain Pilot. Do thou likewise. As she groped wearily down the companionway behind Toranaga, she noticed that the bosun Pesaro was commanding the longboat. Her skin crawled and she almost heaved. She willed the spasm away, thankful that Toranaga had ordered them all off this malodorous vessel. A fair wind and safe voyage, Ferriera called down to them. He waved once and the salutation was returned and then the longboat cast off. Stand down when the longboat's back and that bitch galley's out of sight, he ordered the chief gunner. On the quarterdeck he stopped in front of Rodriguez. He pointed at the galley. You'll live to regret keeping him alive. That's in the hands of God. The Ingles is an acceptable pilot, if you could pass over his religion, my captain general. I've considered that. And? The sooner we're in Macau the better. Make record time, Rodriguez. Ferriera went below. Rodriguez's leg was throbbing badly. He took a swig from the grog sack. May Ferriera go to hell, he told himself. But please God, not until we reach Lisbon. The wind veered slightly and a cloud reached for the nimbus of the moon, rain not far off and dawn streaking the sky. He put his full attention on his ship and her sails and the lie of her. When he was completely satisfied, he watched the longboat, and finally the galley. He sipped more rum, content that his plan had worked so neatly, even the pistol shot that had closed the issue, and content with his decision. It was mine to make, and I made it. Even so, Ingles, he said with a great sadness, the Captain General's right. With thee, heresy has come to Eden. Chapter 29 Anjin San? Hi. Blackthorn swooped out of a deep sleep. Here's some food. And Cha. For a moment he could not remember who he was or where he was. Then he recognized his cabin aboard the galley. A shaft of sunlight was piercing the darkness. He felt greatly rested. There was no drumbeat now and even in his deepest sleep, his senses had told him that the anchor was being lowered and his ship was safe, near shore, the sea gentle. He saw a maid carrying a tray, Mariko beside her her arm no longer in a sling and he was lying in the pilot's bunk, the same that he had used during the Rodriguez voyage from Anjiro village to Osaka and that was now, in a way, almost as familiar as his own bunk and cabin aboard Erasmus. Erasmus. It'll be grand to be back aboard and to see the lads again. He stretched luxuriously, then took the cup of cha Mariko offered. Thank you. That's delicious. How's your arm? Much better, thank you. Mariko flexed it to show him. It was just a flesh wound. You're looking better, Mariko-san. Yes, I'm better now. When she had come back aboard at dawn with Toranaga, she had been near fainting. Better to stay aloft, he had told her. The sickness will leave you faster. My master asks asks why the pistol shot? It was just a game pilot's play, he had told her. My master compliments you on your seamanship. We were lucky. The moon helped. And the crew were marvelous. Mariko-san, would you ask the captain-san if he knows these waters? Sorry, but tell Torinaga-sama I can't keep awake much longer. Or can we hove to for an hour or so out to sea? I've got to sleep. He vaguely remembered her telling him that Torinaga said he could go below, that the Captain San was quite capable as they would be staying in coastal waters and not going out to sea. Blackthorn stretched again and opened a cabin porthole. A rocky shore was two hundred odd yards away. Where are we? Off the coast of Tatami Province, Anjin San. Lord Torinaga wanted to swim and to rest the oarsmen for a few hours. We'll be at Anjiro tomorrow. The fishing village? That's impossible. 
It's near noon and at dawn we were off Osaka. It's impossible. Ah, uh, that was yesterday, Anjin-san. You've slept a day and a night and half another day, she replied. Lord Toranaga said to let you sleep. Now he thinks a swim would be good to wake you up. After food. Food was two bowls of rice and charcoal roasted fish with the dark, salt bitter, vinegar sweet sauce that she had told him was made from fermented beans. Thank you, yes, I'd like a swim. Almost thirty-six hours? No wonder I feel fine. He took the tray from the maid, ravenous. But he did not eat at once. Why is she afraid? He asked. She's not, Anjin-san. Just a little nervous. Please excuse her. She's never seen a foreigner close to before. Tell her when the moon's full, barbarians sprout horns and fire comes out of our mouths like dragons. Mariko laughed. I certainly will not. She pointed to the sea table. There is tooth powder and a brush and water and fresh towels. Then said in Latin, It pleasures me to see thou art well. It is as was related on the march, thou hast great bravery. Their eyes locked and then the moment was allowed to pass. She bowed politely. The maid bowed. The door closed behind them. Don't think about her, he ordered himself. Think about Toranaga or Anjiro. Why do we stop at Anjiro tomorrow? To offload Yabu? Good riddance. Omi will be at Anjiro. What about Omi? Why not ask Toranaga for Omi's head? He owes you a favor or two. Or why not ask to fight Omi-san? How? With pistols or with swords? You'd have no chance with a sword and it'd be murder if you had a gun. Better to do nothing and wait. You'll have a chance soon, and then you'll be revenged on both of them. You bask in Toranaga's favor now. Be patient. Ask yourself what you need from him. Soon we'll be in Yido, so you've not much time. What about Toranaga? Blackthorn was using the chopsticks as he had seen the men in the prison use them, lifting the bowl of rice to his lips and pushing the tacky rice from the lip of the bowl into his mouth with the sticks. The pieces of fish were more difficult. He was still not deft enough, so he used his fingers, glad to eat alone, knowing that to eat with his fingers would be very impolite in front of Mariko or Toranaga or any Japanese. When every morsel was gone he was still famished. Got to get more food, he said aloud. Jesus God in heaven, I'd like some fresh bread and fried eggs and butter and cheese. He came on deck. Almost everyone was naked. Some of the men were drying themselves, others sunbathing, and a few were leaping overboard. In the sea alongside the ship, samurai and seamen were swimming or splashing as children would. Kanichi wa, Anjin-san. Kanichi wa, Toranaga-sama, he said. Toranaga, quite naked, was coming up the gangway that had been let down to the sea. Sanada wa ajitimo ka, he said, motioning at the sea slapping the water off his belly and his shoulders, warm under the bright sun. Hi, Toranaga-sama, Domo, Blackthorn said, presuming that he was being asked if he wanted to swim. Again Toranaga pointed at the sea and spoke shortly, then called Mariko to interpret. Mariko walked down from the poop deck, shielding her head with a crimson sunshade, her informal white cotton kimono casually belted. Toranaga-sama says you look very rested, Anjin-san. The water's invigoration. Invigorating, he said, correcting her politely. Yes. Ah, uh, thank you, invigorating. He says please swim then. Toranaga was leaning carelessly against the gunwale, wiping the water out of his ears with a small towel, and when his left ear would not clear, he hung his head over and hopped on his left. Heel until it did. Blackthorn saw that Toranaga was very muscular and very taut, apart from his belly. Ill at ease, very conscious of Mariko, he stripped off his shirt and his codpiece and trousers until he was equally naked. Lord Toranaga asks if all Englishmen are as hairy as you? The hair is so fair? Some are, he said. We our men don't have hair on their chests or arms like you do. Not very much. He says you've a very good build. 
So has he. Please thank him. Blackthorn walked away from her to the head of the gangplank, aware of her and the young woman, Fujiko, who was kneeling on the poop under a yellow parasol, a maid beside her, also watching him. Then, unable to contain his dignity enough to walk naked all the way down to the sea, he dived over the side into the pale blue water. It was a fine dive and the sea chill reached into him exhilaratingly. The sandy bottom was three fathoms down, seaweed waving, multitudes of fish unfrightened by the swimmers. Near the seabed his plummeting stopped, and he twisted and played with the fish, then surfaced and began a seemingly lazy, easy, but very fast overarm stroke for the shore that Albin Caradoc had taught him. The small bay was desolate, many rocks, a tiny pebbled shore, and no sign of life. Mountains climbed a thousand feet to a blue, measureless sky. He lay on a rock sunning himself, for samurai had swum with him and were not far away. They smiled and waved. Later he swam back, and they followed. Torinaga was still watching him. He came up on deck. His clothes were gone. Fujiko and Mariko and two maids were still there. One of the maids bowed and offered him a ridiculously small towel which he took and began to dry himself with, turning uneasily into the gunnel. I order you to be at ease, he told himself. You're at ease naked in a locked room with Felicity, aren't you? It's only in public when women are around when she's around that you're embarrassed. Why? They don't notice nakedness, and that's totally sensible. You're in Japan. You're to do as they do. You will be like them and act like a king. Lord Toronaga says you swim very well. Would you teach him that stroke? Mariko was saying. I'd be glad to, he said and forced himself to turn around and lean as Toronaga was leaning. Mariko was smiling up at him looking so pretty, he thought. The way you dived into the sea. We've we've never seen that before. We always jump. He wants to learn how to do that. Now? Yes, please. I can teach him at least, I can try. A maid was holding a cotton kimono for Blackthorn so, gratefully, he slipped it on, tying it with the belt. Now, completely relaxed, he explained how to dive, how to tuck your head between your arms and spring up and out but to beware of belly flopping. It's best to start from the foot of the gangway and sort of fall in head first to begin with, without jumping or running. That's the way we teach children. Torinaga listened and asked questions and then, when he was satisfied, he said through Mariko, Good. I think I understand. He walked to the head of the gangway. Before Blackthorn could stop him, Torinaga had launched himself toward the water, fifteen feet below. The belly flop was vicious. No one laughed. Torinaga spluttered back to the deck and tried again. Again he landed flat. Other samurai were equally unsuccessful. It's not easy, Blackthorn said. It took me a long time to learn. Give it a rest and we'll try again tomorrow. Lord Toranaga says, tomorrow is tomorrow. Today I will learn how to dive. Blackthorn put his kimono aside and demonstrated again. Samurai ate him. Again they failed. So did Toranaga. Six times. After another demonstration dive Blackthorn scrambled onto the foot of the gangplank and saw Mariko among them, nude, readying to launch herself into space. Her body was exquisite, the bandage on her upper arm fresh. Wait, Mariko-san! Better to try from here. The first time. Very well, Anjin-san. She walked down to him, the tiny crucifix enhancing her nudity. He showed her how to bend and to fall forward into the sea, catching her by the waist to turn her over so that her head went in first. Then Toranaga tried near the waterline and was moderately successful. Mariko tried again and the touch of her skin warmed Blackthorn and he clowned momentarily and fell into the water, directing them from there until he had cooled off. Then he ran up to the deck and stood on the gunwale and showed them a dead man's dive, which he thought might be easier knowing that it was vital for Toranaga to succeed. But you've got to keep rigid, high, Like a sword. Then you cannot fail. 
he fell outward. The dive was clean and he trod water and waited. Several samurai came forward but Toronaga waved them aside. He held up his arms stiffly, his backbone straight. His chest and loins were scarlet from the belly flops. Then he let himself fall forward as Blackthorn had shown. His head went into the water first and his legs tumbled over him. But it was a dive and the first successful dive of any of them, and a roar of approval greeted him when he surfaced. He did it again, this time better. Other men followed, some successful, others not. Then Noriko tried. Blackthorn saw the taut little breasts and tiny waist, flat stomach and curving legs. A flicker of pain went across her face as she lifted her arms above her head. But she held herself like an arrow and fell bravely outward. She speared the water cleanly. Almost no one except him noticed. That was a fine dive. Really fine, he said, giving her a hand to lift her easily out of the water onto the gangway platform. You should stop now. You might open up the cut on your arm. Yes, thank you, Anjin-san. She stood beside him, barely reaching his shoulder, very pleased with herself. That's a rare sensation, the falling outward and the having to stay stiff, and most of all, the having to dominate your fear. Yes, that was a very rare sensation indeed. She walked up the companionway and put on the kimono that the maid held out for her. Then, drying her face delicately, she went below. Christ Jesus, that's much woman, he thought. That sunset Toranaga sent for Blackthorn. He was sitting on the poop deck on clean futons near a small charcoal brazier upon which small pieces of aromatic wood were smoking. They were used to perfume the air and keep away the dusk gnats and mosquitoes. His kimono was pressed and neat, and the huge, wing-like shoulders of the starched overmantel gave him a formidable presence. Yabu, too, was formally dressed, and Mariko. Fujiko was also there. Twenty samurai sat silently on guard. Flares were set into stands and the galley still swung calmly at anchor in the bay. Sake, Anjin-san? Domo, Torinaga-sama. Blackthorn bowed and accepted the small cup from Fujiko, lifted it in toast to Torinaga and drained it. The cup was immediately refilled. Blackthorn was wearing a brown uniform kimono and it felt easier and freer than his own clothes. Lord Toranaga says we're staying here tonight. Tomorrow we arrive at Anjiro. He would like to hear more about your country and the world outside. Of course. What would he like to know? It's a lovely night, isn't it? Blackthorn settled himself comfortably, aware of her femininity. Too aware. Strange, I'm more conscious of her now that she's clothed than when she wore nothing. Yes, very. Soon it will be humid, Anjin-san. Summer is not a good time. She told Toranaga what she had said. My master says to tell you that Yido is marshy. The mosquitoes are bad in summer, but spring and autumn are beautiful, yes. Truly the birth and the dying seasons of the year are beautiful. England's temperate. The winter's bad perhaps one winter in seven. And the summer also. Famine about once in six years, though sometimes we get two bad years in a row. We have famine too. All famine is bad. How is it in your country now? We've had bad harvests three times in the last ten years and no sun to ripen the corn. But that's the hand of the Almighty. Now England's very strong. We're prosperous. Our people work hard. We make all our own cloth, all arms most of the woolen cloth of Europe. A few silks come from France but the quality's poor and they're only for the very rich. Blackthorn decided not to tell them about plague or the riots or insurrections caused by enclosing the common lands and the drift of peasants to towns and to cities. Instead he told them about the good kings and queens, sound leaders and wise parliaments and successful wars. Lord Toronaga wants to be quite clear. You claim only sea power protects you from Spain and Portugal? Yes. That alone. Command of our seas keeps us free. You're an island nation too, just like us. Without command of your seas, aren't you also defenseless against an outside enemy? 
my master agrees with you. Ah, uh, you've been invaded too? Blackthorn saw a slight frown as she turned to Toranaga and he reminded himself to confine himself to answers and not questions. When she spoke to him again she was more grave. Lord Toranaga says I should answer your question, Anjin-san. Yes, we've been invaded twice. More than three hundred years ago it would be one thousand two hundred and seventy-four of your counting the Mongols of Kublai Khan, who had just conquered China and Korea, came against us when we refused to submit to his authority. A few thousand men landed in Kyushu but our samurai managed to contain them, and after a while the enemy withdrew. But seven years later they came again. This time the invasion consisted of almost a thousand Chinese and Korean ships with two hundred thousand enemy troops Mongols, Chinese, and Korean mostly cavalry. In all Chinese history, this was the greatest invasion force ever assembled. We were helpless against such an overwhelming force, Anjin San. Again they began to land at Hakata Bay in Kyushu but before they could deploy all their armies a great wind, a typhoon, came out of the south and destroyed the fleet and all it contained. Those left ashore were quickly killed. It was a kamikaze, a divine wind, Anjin San. She said with complete belief, a kamikaze sent by the gods to protect this land of the gods from the foreign. Invader the Mongols never came back and after eighty years or so their dynasty, the Qin, was thrown out of China. Mariko added with great satisfaction. The gods protected us against them. The gods will always protect us against invasion. After all, this is their land, nay? Blackthorn thought about the huge numbers of ships and men in the invasion. It made the Spanish Armada against England seem insignificant. We were helped by a storm too, senora he said with equal seriousness. Many believe it was also sent by God. Certainly it was a miracle and who knows, perhaps it was. He glanced at the brazier as a coal spluttered and flames danced. Then he said, The Mongols nearly engulfed us in Europe too. He told her how the hordes of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan's grandfather, had come almost to the gates of Vienna before his onslaught was stopped and then turned back, mountains of skulls in his wake. People in those days believed Genghis Khan and his soldiers were sent by God to punish the world for its sins. Lord Toranaga says he was just a barbarian who was immensely good at war. Yes. Even so, in England we bless our luck we're an island. We thank God for that and the channel. And our navy. With China so close and so powerful and with you and China at war I'm surprised you don't have a big navy. Aren't you afraid of another attack? Mariko did not answer but translated for Toranaga what had been said. When she had finished, Toranaga spoke to Yabu, who nodded and answered, equally serious. The two men conversed for a while. Mariko answered another question from Toranaga, then spoke to Blackthorn once more. To control your seas, Anjin-san, how many ships do you need? I don't know exactly. But now the Queen's got perhaps a hundred and fifty ships of the line. Those are ships built only for war. My master asks how many ships a year does your Queen build? Twenty to thirty warships, the best and fleetest in the world. But the ships are usually built by private groups of merchants, and then sold to the crown. For a profit? Blackthorn remembered samurai opinion of profit and money. The queen generously gives more than the actual cost to encourage research and new styles of building. Without royal favor this would hardly be possible. For example, Erasmus, my ship, is a new class, an English design built under license in Holland. Could you build such a ship here? Yes. If I had carpenters, interpreters, and all the materials in time. First I'd have to build a smaller vessel. I've never built one entirely by myself before so I'd have to experiment. Of course, he added, attempting to contain his excitement as the idea developed. Of course, if Lord Toranaga wanted a ship, or ships, perhaps a trade could be arranged. Perhaps he could order a number of warships to be built in England. We could sail them out here for him rigged as he'd want and armed as he'd want. Mariko translated. 
Torinaga's interest heightened. So did Yabus. He asks, can our sailors be trained to sail such ships? Certainly, given time. We could arrange for the sailing masters or one of them to stay in your waters for a year. Then he could set up a training program for you. In a few years you'd have your own navy. A modern navy. Second to none. Mariko spoke for a time. Torunaga questioned her again searchingly, and so did Yabu. Yabu-san asks, second to none? Yes. Better than anything the Spaniards would have. Or the Portuguese. A silence gathered. Torunaga was evidently swept by the idea though he tried to hide it. My master asks, are you sure this could be arranged? Yes. How long would it take? Two years for me to sail home. Two years to build a ship or ships. Two to sail back. Half the cost would have to be paid in advance, the remainder on delivery. Torunaga thoughtfully leaned forward and put some more aromatic wood on the brazier. They all watched him and waited. Then he talked with Yabu at length. Mariko did not translate what was being said and Blackthorn knew better than to ask, as much as he would dearly have liked to be party to the conversation. He studied them all, even the girl Fujiko, who also listened attentively, but he could gather nothing from any of them. He knew this was a brilliant idea that could bring immense profit and guarantee his safe passage back to England. Anjinsan, how many ships could you sail out? A flotilla of five ships at a time would be best. You could expect to lose at least one ship through storm, tempest, or Spanish-Portuguese interference, I'm sure they try very hard to prevent your having warships. In ten years Lord Toronaga could have a navy of fifteen to twenty ships. He let her translate that, then he continued slowly. The first flotilla could bring you master carpenters, shipwrights, gunners, seamen, and masters. In ten to fifteen years, England could supply Lord Toronaga with thirty modern warships, more than enough to dominate your home waters. And by that time, if you wanted, you could possibly be building your own replacements here. Wheel. He was going to say, sell, but change the word. My queen would be honored to help you form your own navy, and yes, if you wish, we'll train it and provision it. Oh yes, he thought exultantly, as the final embellishment to the plan dropped into place and we'll officer it and provide the admiral and the queen will offer you a binding alliance good for you and good for us which will be part of the trade, and then together, friend Torinaga. We will harry the Spaniard and Portuguese dog out of these seas and own them forever. This could be the greatest single trading pact any nation has ever made, he thought gleefully. And with an Anglo-Japanese fleet clearing these seas, we English will dominate the Japan-China silk trade. Then it'll be millions every year. If I can pull this off, I'll turn the course of history. I'll have riches and honors beyond my dream. I'll become an ancestor. And to become an ancestor is just about the best thing a man can try to do, even though he fails in the trying. My master says it's a pity you don't speak our language. Yes, but I'm sure you're interpreting perfectly. He says that not as a criticism of me, Anjin-san but as an observation. It's true. It would be much better for my lord to talk direct, as I can talk to you. Do you have any dictionaries, Mariko-san? And grammars Portuguese-Japanese or Latin-Japanese grammars? If Lord Toronaga could help me with books and teachers I'd try to learn your tongue. We have no such books. But the Jesuits have. You said so yourself? Ah. She spoke to Toronaga and Blackthorn saw both Yabu's and Toronaga's eyes light up, and smiles spread over their faces. My master says you will be helped, Anjin-san. At Toronaga's orders Fujiko gave Blackthorn and Yabu more sake. Toronaga drank only cha, as did Mariko. Unable to contain himself, Blackthorn said, What does he say to my suggestion? What's his answer? Anjin-san, it would be better to be patient. He will answer in his own time. Please ask him now. Reluctantly Mariko turned to Toronaga. Please excuse me, sire, 
but the Anjin San asks with great deference, What do you think of his plan? He very humbly and most politely requests an answer. He'll have my answer in good time. Mariko said to Blackthorn, My master says he will consider your plan and think carefully about what you have said. He asks you to be patient. Domo, Toranaga-sama. I'm going to bed now. We'll leave at dawn. Toranaga got up. Everyone followed him below, except Blackthorn. Blackthorn was left with the night. At first promise of dawn, Toranaga released four of the carrier pigeons that had been sent to the ship with the main baggage when the ship was being prepared. The birds circled twice, then broke off, two homing for Osaka, two for Yido. The cipher message to Karitsubo was an order to be passed on to Hiromatsu that they should all attempt to leave peacefully at once. Should they be prevented, they were to lock themselves in. The moment the door was forced they were to set fire to that part of the castle and to commit seppuku. The cipher to his son Sidara, in Yido, told that he had escaped, was safe, and ordered him to continue secret preparations for war. Get to sea, Captain. Yes, Lord. By noon they had crossed the bite between Tatami and Aiza provinces and were off Cape Ito, the southernmost point of the Aiza peninsula. The wind was fair, the swell modest, and the single mainsail helped their passage. Then, close by shore in a deep channel between the mainland and some small rock islands, when they had turned north, there was an ominous rumbling ashore. All oars ceased. What in the name of Christ? Blackthorn's eyes were riveted shoreward. Suddenly a huge fissure snaked up the cliffs and a million tons of rock avalanched into the sea. The water seemed to boil for a moment. A small wave came out to the galley, then passed by. The avalanche ceased. Again the rumbling, deeper now and more growling, but farther off. Rocks dribbled from the cliffs. Everyone listened intently and waited, watching the cliff face. Sounds of gulls, of surf and wind. Then Toranaga motioned to the drum master, who picked up the beep once more. The oars began. Life on the ship became normal. What was that? Blackthorn said. Just an earthquake. Mariko was perplexed. You don't have earthquakes? No. Never. I've never seen one before. Oh, we have them frequently, Anjin-san. That was nothing, just a small one. The main shock center would be somewhere else, even out to sea. Or perhaps this one was just a little one here, all by itself. You were lucky to witness a small one. It was as though the whole earth was shaking. I could have sworn I saw. I've heard about tremors. In the Holy Land and the Ottomans, they have them sometimes. Jesus! He exhaled, his heart still thumping roughly. I could have sworn I saw that whole cliff shake. Oh, it did, Anjin-san. When you're on land, it's the most terrible feeling in the whole world. There's no warning, Anjin-san. The tremors come in waves, sometimes sideways, sometimes up and down, sometimes three or four shakes quickly. Sometimes a small one followed by a greater one a day later. There's no pattern. The worst that I was in was at night, six years ago near Osaka, the third day of the month of the falling leaves. Our house collapsed on us, Anjin-san. We weren't hurt, my son and I. We dug ourselves out. The shocks went on for a week or more, some bad, some very bad. The Taiko's great new castle at Fujimi was totally destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of people were lost in that earthquake and in the fires that followed. That's the greatest danger, Anjinsen the fires that always follow. Our towns and cities and villages die so easily. Sometimes there is a bad earthquake far out to sea and legend has it that this causes the birth of the great waves. They are ten or twenty feet high. There is never a warning and they have no season. A great wave just comes out of the sea to our shores and sweeps inland. Cities can vanish. Yido was half destroyed some years ago by such a wave. This is normal for you? Every year? Oh, yes. Every year in this land of the gods we have earth tremors. 
and fires and flood and great waves, and the monster storms the typhons. Nature is very strong with us. Tears gathered at the corners of her eyes. Perhaps that is why we love life so much, Anjin San. You see, we have to. Death is part of our air and sea and earth. You should know, Anjin San, in this land of tears, death is our heritage. <laughs>